Well, hey, good morning. Glad you're with us. I'm going to be real brief this morning. You know how to contact us if you've been here with us week to week. And you know that we would desire to be serving you in your life. So if you have needs, please let us know. Our website, our app, and even down below the video, there are, there are ways to connect with us. We're especially thankful, though, that so many uh, of you here in our campus, but also the other campuses, are, are walking along with us and continuing in life together in the body of Christ, even while you're maintaining distance. And uh, I want to just encourage you this morning that we are here for you. And if there's ways that we can serve you, we want to know what they are. So please reach out. Please let us know. Uh, we're going to sing. We're going to come together to God's word. And then we're going to go out with a last word from God's word that will be encouraging. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, we just thank you for the grace of God in Jesus. And we thank you that that, that grace brings us into discipleship. And that you have a way that that can fit together for us, that discipleship is not burdensome, but is a direct outgrowth of the grace in which we stand. So please draw us to yourself this morning in our worship. Be glorified in our worship. And please bring forth fruit that will last in your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice, he is worthy of our praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King, and with trembling rejoice. We are children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, bought with sacrificial blood. Bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. Rejoice, come and lift your heads and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your all our sorrows jesus carried up the hill he has walked this path before us he is walking with us still turning tragedy to triumph turning agony to praise there is blessing in the battle so take heart and stand amazed rejoice when you cry to him he hears your Suffering, he will help you sing. Rejoice, come and lift your head and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King and with
Amen. Our scripture today comes from Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Amen. Today, as you join us to worship our Lord, I encourage you to lay down your burdens. There's a lot of things we're carrying these days. I encourage you to take a moment, whether singing or through contemplative prayer, honestly unburden yourself before the Lord. Give him the things on your heart and allow him to exchange his burden or his yoke, which is light. Come back. 
morning. We're starting a series this morning through the letter Titus. It's a, it's a letter with three chapters, and we have four weeks. So we're going to have one sermon per chapter for the next three weeks, and then a message at the end, uh, wrapping it up about the need and the call for there to be godly men and for there to be godly women when the church exists in challenging times, as they did in Crete, as we do today. I've been looking forward to this and so I invite you to meet me in God's word in Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Because we've got a, a letter to Titus from the Apostle Paul. Now, Titus was one of the traveling band of gospel workers that Paul had had with him for the long haul. And Paul had given him a specific assignment to go and to put in order and to further establish, and especially to further establish the leadership in the churches that had been planted um, throughout Greece, where he is today, where he is at the time of the writing, is in Crete. And there's a reason that Paul wrote this letter to Titus. And the reason is there were problems at the church in Crete. And so we'll but first begin with understanding why this letter was written and what the problems were that the church was having there. And then we'll go back and we will see what it is that Paul prescribed and what it is that Paul directed Titus uh, to do to approach these problems. And we find that they are actually completely in line with what God's word on balance directs us to approach our Christian lives with. And so it's a great picture of the Christian life and how we are to live and how we're to pursue it. But read with me in, in uh, Titus 1.10. I'm going to read about the problem that, there, that was there in Crete. Paul says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. I think that's one of the funny lines in Paul's letters. One of the Cretan uh, writers says that the Cretans are terrible folks. He's right. The problem was in Crete was a problem of bad leaders of poor character. There were bad leaders of poor character in Crete. Now, we don't know exactly who they all were. We do know that Crete was a Gentile area and that the, the, the men on the island of Crete had, in the main, uh, come from a background of being mercenary soldiers. So the island of Crete at that time was, was primarily settled and populated with, with men who had been soldiers, but mercenaries, willing to fight for whatever side. Um, and then along with them, the women that, that were part of their lives, the women that were there with them, uh, and then the children as well. But it was, it was just a tough area full of people of bad character uh, in the main. As the church had been established, it had grown there. It's a, it's a difficult environment for the church, which has a call to discipleship and purity and to follow Jesus with a pure heart, to find root and be established in a place like Crete. So the leaders who were there who had uh, reflected more of the, the problems and the corruption of the Cretan culture were causing problems for this newly established church. And we see, see there, Paul said that they needed to be silenced. But going on from there in verse 13, he says more to Titus about what needs to happen. This testimony is true about the Cretans and their character. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and the unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. 
Keep in mind, Paul here is talking about the, the leaders of the church in Crete. They were people whose character you could not count on. If anything, it seems that you could count on their character to be flawed and to be intentionally bad. He mentions that some of them are teaching just for shameful gain. They're just teaching for the money in it. Somehow they were enriching themselves at the church in Crete. And he, he comes down there at the end. He says, you know, to the pure, all things are pure. I think that's really fundamentally true. You think about a person whose heart is fully devoted to Christ, a person who is a disciple of Jesus, uh, a slave to him. Their life, their heart, their mind is going to be characteristically and increasingly pure as they approach the different spheres of their life, whether they are in the Word, whether they are in prayer, in a, a, a spiritual discipline kind of part of their life, or whether they're dealing with family matters, whether they're dealing with business matters, with relationships, they're going to have a pure heart and a pure mind in those situations, and they will find there things that they can process and that they can conduct themselves within with purity. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. That picture of someone who's walking in purity, walking in uh a fully devoted followership of Jesus is something that many of us uh, can recognize because we've aspired to that. We want to be increasingly pure in our devotion to Jesus. And the point Paul's making is these guys that are leading, they're the whole opposite of that. They're the complete and full other side of the coin. They've got to be stopped. And that is why Paul wrote a letter to Titus to direct him in his work with the church in Crete. So how does Paul encourage Titus to go at this problem? What is it that he has to say to Titus to direct him and how it is he needs to go forward? And like he does in most of his letters, Paul is straightforward and in this way is very simple because he begins with the message of grace and then he follows it with the message of discipleship. The word of grace in Jesus, and then the call to discipleship as followers of Jesus. That's what we see in Titus chapter 1. Next week we'll see again that that's what we see in Titus chapter 2. There's a grounding, a rooting in the grace of God that comes from Jesus and from what he did on the cross. The grace of God in Jesus and the power that he has in his victorious resurrection. Paul starts by reminding Titus of that. Paul starts by with a greeting that, that reflects that and then goes on from there, establishing that grounding to say that the fruit that grows from that, the trees that grow from that, the plants that grow from that are trees and plants of disciples. Uh, Titus needs to go at this problem by being rooted in the grace of God, this in Jesus. And then from there, pursuing discipleship, encouraging people to be rooted in the grace of Godless and Jesus and encouraging people to then pursue discipleship from that ground. In, in a very significant way, that is the Christian life. And so read with me in verse one as he talks about the grace of Godless and Jesus. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The message of grace that, that Paul begins with starts with the hope of eternal life. Verse two, he writes in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began. God has promised salvation to those who he is calling and to those uh, who he has given this blessing to. It says, um, before the ages began. 
saying in verse one that Paul is writing for the sake of God's elect. There is something eternally certain about the salvation of those that God has drawn to himself in Crete. Paul's reminding Titus, these people that are my children here on the island of Crete, they are my children because I have had grace on them, and my grace on them is deeper and runs farther than you could ever imagine. I have grace for them, and that grace is manifested. Verse three, at the proper time, it was manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. There was grace before there was time. That grace before there was time for those that God is redeeming is now manifested through Paul's preaching, but but broaden that out through the apostolic preaching of the gospel's truth. So preaching that is in line with the apostles' teaching and preaching of the grace of God in Jesus Christ is a manifestation. It's the bringing to fruition of this grace that God has for his people and has had from before there was time. So therefore, you have the customary opening from Paul uh, in verse 4, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Paul typically opens and closes his letters with a word of grace. And I think that is a great thing to remember as we then move to thinking about the demands of discipleship. What is it that God has for you fundamentally as a Christian? What is it that God has fundamentally for you as his child? Or as we'll see in, in, in Titus 2, as a, as a doulos, as a servant, a bondservant, or slave to Christ. Well, the first thing he has for you is grace. Saving grace. Grace that is deeper than you know, that, that is uh, even grace before time, and grace that is now manifested to you, that you now know about because of the word of God and because of how the message of the gospel has come to you. We take that for granted in some ways, but that is such a beautiful, simple, but deep reality. Christians are those who've received grace from God because of Jesus and because we know of what he has done through the preaching of the gospel. With that grounding, then, Paul turns to the call to discipleship. I want to just just give you an illustration this morning for what I think is a good way to think about this call to discipleship. It's, it's, it's a biblical illustration of a plumb line. I'm holding it up here high because I'm seated, but this is a homemade plumb line. It's dental floss and a doorstop. But when it stops moving, the benefit of it, if you, if you were using it in a construction environment, if you were using it while you're working on a project at your house, is that it will be perfectly level in a vertical plane. A plumb line is essentially a homemade level. A lot of us would use levels now if we were working on a similar project, but a plumb line is a level that's perfect and is easy to make and that has always been around. God's word and God's call to discipleship is is like that for us. It's something that that is timeless, that is held in front of us, It is very clear, and and it says in Psalm 119, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The call to discipleship, God's word, is perfect, like a plumb line. We can measure ourselves by it, and we can aspire to a further obedience to it. That's what we see, I think, as we go forward here into Titus chapter 1. Verse 5, Paul says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might... Put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Pause for a moment. Do you know that New Life is organized or structured in such a way that we are a church that is led by an elder team? The authority at New Life Church lies not with one person. It lies with not each of the campus pastors, but ultimately the authority and the weight of walking with God as a faithful church at New Life rests with New Life's elder team. I think there's going to be a picture coming up of those guys. I am not certain, but I think so. And if it, if that is, it's going to be up there right now. But these are men who have, uh, in their walk with God, been uh, 
been willing to put themselves forward and sacrificially with their time and with a piece of their devo- their focus and attention of their lives, give attention to leading our church to biblical faithfulness and into the mission that God has for us. And that is what Titus was to do as well. He was to appoint elders in every town. Paul had directed him to do that in the towns where the church had been established. Make sure there's eldership. Make sure there's good leadership that is sound and men within that setup, that structure, whose character is also sound. He goes on in verse six. He says, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, And his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright and holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. In that last verse, we see a connection to the problem that was in Crete that we we began with. Those verses about the problem in Crete from 10 to 16, they follow this section. And in verse 9, Paul says that the, the elders, they must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he or so that they may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. The corrupt leadership or the unleadership, if you would, that is being provided by these bad leaders is to be replaced by good, sound, solid leadership coming from these elders who would both teach the truth, and confront and rebuke those who contradict it. The outcome of Titus' ministry in Crete is to be that. We talked about Crete, we've talked about its situation, but but I want to just take this section and translate it uh, to a way that I think is very, very biblical to think about it in personal life. Because uh, the, the biblical qualifications for eldership are a great plumb line for all of us. And I would say this morning, particularly for men, they certainly are a great plumb line for all of us. And actually, everything that I am about to to share or mention is is applicable to men and women. I just have always thought when I was first as a young man, and then as I have grown and I'm not quite the youngest of men anymore, that the qualifications of biblical eldership, they're a great plumb line. They show what's clearly in front of us as God's way that he would have us to be. And I wanna just encourage you to think about these things in that way this morning, and so let's look at them. Verse six, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, uh, that's a mark of being above reproach. And so the first mark of being above reproach is their family life. You know, if you want to walk with God in Christ Jesus, it will affect your family life. I know I'm talking to people who are in all kinds of different circumstances of family life. For some of you, you are single. For others, you are married. I know we have some who are divorced. And I know we have some who are kids who are still in the process of raising up and growing to the point in life where they would be in one of those categories. But whatever your station, one of the clear marks of a disciple of Jesus is it affects you in your family life. Now, each of these things, we're going we're gonna to look at five things, is a mark of being above reproach. I love that term because I've been challenged by it since my youth. I, mean, I came across this book and what it teaches here when I was still in my teens. I, I do not always uh, hit the bar, but I, I always want to aspire to be somebody who is completely above reproach. As Paul was encouraging Titus to leave as the standard in front of those who would lead in the church. Be above reproach in your family life. Verse uh, 7, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. So, The second area has to do with not being licentious and not being 
unself-controlled or self-uncontrolled. Family life, personal character. And it's not just the things you're not supposed to be, but verse 8, he must hold, uh, excuse me, he should be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now just think about this for a second. If a church is led by men who thoroughly meet these qualifications in their life, with consistency over time. That you can count on the character of the people that lead the church. That church is gonna be in a good situation because of it. Now, I'm not saying it's all about the people that lead. I'm not saying it's all about any of these things. Actually, we know it, like any of these things as it, just by itself. We know that the, the furthering of God's mission in the church is a spiritual thing that is spiritually powered that the Spirit of God is at work. But what Titus is saying here is that one of the ways he works in the church is he gives her qualified, high-character leaders. Okay, well then how does that come down to us when we think about it as a plumb line for our own situations? We're to be above reproach. We're to be pursuing that kind of reality in our family life, whatever our role, whatever our station. We're to put off and put on, put off the old man. He says that there should be nobody who is arrogant, quick-tempered, a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, who is a leader in the church, but in the same way. Not speaking as a pastor, speaking as a person. I'm called as a disciple of Jesus to not be arrogant and not be quick-tempered. I'm called as a disciple to not be a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. You are too. There's a putting off of bad character. It says in Ephesians, through the renewal of our minds. And then a putting on of good character, of the new man, of the new woman, in Christ Jesus, in the resources of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see in verse 8. That in the relationships that we have, all the way around, we are virtuous in every direction. Hospitable, so virtuous towards others in the way that you share what it is that God has given to you. A lover of good and self-controlled. Upright. Uh, it speaks to the personal sphere. Just that, that there is an integrity of life that a disciple of, of Christ can have. And if that plumb line is what they're looking at, they are going to be somebody who is a lover of good and self-controlled and upright and also holy. Holy is a God word. word. So the relationships with others, we have the idea of the relationship to yourself. Like this is, this is who I am and how I'm pursuing my life. They are holy. That is a word unto God that they are growing in holiness. And they're disciplined. They're men of God, verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So I'm making, again, this connection between God's call on elders, but then the plumb line of what we're to aspire to as Christians. And I especially want to target and focus in on the men. We are to be men of the word. We are to be men of the word who who know it in such a way and who have been uh, transformed, who have been instructed by it, who have been formed and shaped by it in such a way that we also are able to rebuke what needs to be rebuked and contradicted and that we're able to to instruct in sound ways others, especially just even in our homes. Uh, The people in our own sphere of relationships instruct them in what is good and what is godly from God's word. There's one one last little phrase in here I want to show you. In verse 7, it says, For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. As God's steward. It reminded me of something that I have increasingly been aware of in my own life over the last years. And I I don't think it's just for me. Uh, One of the ways I have begun to think about my life over the the years has been that I, I simply have a stewardship. 
in each of the spheres that I'm a part of in my life. I have a stewardship at New Life to pastor and pastor and serve and pray and teach well. That's my stewardship as a pastor. So it's not limited to that, but that's at the heart of it. But I also have a stewardship in my home to steward the relationship that I have with Jenny and steward the relationships I have with my three growing kids who are no longer little kids. We have three teenagers now. But there's a stewardship that I have with those relationships. I'm not done with them yet. They're not done with me yet. Really, as long as we're both alive, we will be in each other's lives. But while they are in our home, I have a stewardship. How am I handling my stewardship with raising my kids? I have a stewardship on personal things. Health of body as it relates to discipline. The financial aspects of our life. The way that I choose to pursue purity and pursue discipleship as a Christian. Life is about stewardships. You've got them too. But the overseers as God's steward are to be above reproach. And I just want to tie a bow on this by saying it's it's true for leaders. It's true for elders, but it's a great plumb line for us. We are to pursue being above reproach as our stewardship in each of the spheres we live in. If you start thinking about your life that way as a Christian, you will do well. You'll do well to think that way, and you will find a good, solid plumb line to know what it is that God calls you to as a disciple, and then to go after it with your whole heart. I want to give it just a little quick look forward to next week, because just like Paul opens with a word of grace, these two chapters, Titus 1 and 2, closes with a word of grace. Titus 2.11 It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. And goes on from there. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. In closing, I just want to to put out where I will start next Sunday. The grace of God in Jesus saves And that same grace of God in Jesus trains us. Discipleship in the atmosphere of the gospel is about connecting the grace that God has given you in Christ with the training that that same grace calls and brings you into and being an integrated Christian that pulls these things together in your life. That's what we see in Titus 1, and next week we'll see. That's also what we see in Titus 2. Father, thank you for your word. I pray as we did at the open that you would work through your word, that you would empower men and women and children through your Holy Spirit to pursue a life that is above reproach, walking with you as disciples because of the goodness of the grace in which we stand. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Not be.
And the last word from God's word this morning is from Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy the grace in which you stand.